Life is everywhere, on land and in the oceans. Here in the salt water are billions of living creatures, large and small, some too tiny for the eye to see. Here, for millions of years, plants and animals have lived and died. The sea is like a huge graveyard, and the remains of animals and plants which died there long ago have sometimes become preserved in rocks. These remains are called fossils, and they prove beyond any doubt that life existed long ago. The sea and the wind never stop their work. And in ways like this, dead sea creatures were buried long ago and became fossils. Fresh mud is always piling up on the seabed, layer after layer, brought down by rivers. After enormous periods of time, some seas filled up altogether and became land. So today, fossilized sea creatures of long ago are found far inland and even deep below ground. In some kinds of stone, fossils can be seen quite easily. They're all around, in buildings and streets. You can see them yourself if you'll only stop to look. Samples of rock from deep underground have to be brought to the surface during drilling for oil, and fossils are often found in them too, the shells of microscopically tiny creatures. From the various kinds of fossils, scientists are able to work out the history of life on the Earth. They call this work paleontology, from Greek words meaning ancient life. All interesting fossils are kept, and the especially interesting ones put in museums. In the same way that you and I talk about one year, the paleontologist talks about millions of years. 10,000 years ago, in an age of ice, this mammoth lived. To the paleontologists, it seems just like yesterday. This is the Plesiosaurus, which lived in the sea about 130 million years ago, in the Jurassic period. 60 million years later, the Mosasaurus hunted fish. But not this kind of fish, which lived at quite a different time. The remains of all these fish were discovered lying close together. They date from the Devonian period, 300 million years ago. While these bones are much less old, they belong to cave bears, which lived alongside early man during the Ice Age. They only became extinct tens of thousands of years ago. And now look behind this locked door. These fossils are very rare and precious indeed. They are the remains of primitive human beings, our own ancestors. Before any fossil can be examined, it must first of all be taken out of the rock in which it was formed and where it has rested for so long. This has to be done by specially trained people. It may take months or even years. To look at very tiny fossils inside rock samples, the rock is first crushed and the chippings and mud washed away to leave the fossils behind. If the rock is too hard to crush, it must be sliced instead, and the slice ground down until it's as thin as paper and transparent. In this way, the fossil can only be seen in section. Since we can learn more about a fossil if we can look at it from all sides, crushing's better when possible. Some fossils, microscopically small ones too, belong to particular periods in the distant past. Fossils like these are used in paleontology to help in dating the different underground layers of rock. 
They're called key fossils, and they can give information which is useful, for instance, in exploring for oil. Here's an example. Key fossils from these four oil wells showed that all the rock layers followed a certain slope, including the layer in which oil was found. So in the fifth well, oil was expected here. Instead, the key fossils at this depth were found to come from much younger rocks laid down more recently. This meant that the oil was probably to be found much deeper down, and that all the rock layers must fold sharply downwards. It's interesting to compare fossils from different periods in the past with plants and animals living now. Some of them are surprisingly alike. Look at these fossil ferns. Their modern descendants are very much like them. These present-day bony fish have stayed almost the same since long ago. This is the Mistrosaurus, which lived in the age of the great reptiles. It's very like a modern crocodile. But some animals have changed a lot. The little white outline shows the horse's first known ancestor, no bigger than a fox terrier. It changed many times before reaching its modern size. We know about these earlier types of horse from fossils. Animals now extinct can sometimes be reconstructed out of quite small pieces of skeleton. As much information as possible is collected together and compared. This is a long business, measuring, checking, working out. Then the job of drawing the animal can begin. The bits of skeleton are laid out, each in its proper place. The missing parts are drawn in as correctly as possible. In this way, a fair picture of the complete skeleton can be made. Once this is done, we can get some idea of what the animal looked like when it was alive. It's even been possible to draw a picture of the Cheratherium, which means hand animal, from the only trace it has left behind its footprint, like a human hand. It's a very rare stroke of luck when every single piece of an extinct animal skeleton is found so that it can be put together complete. And so, out of what looks like a jumble of bits and pieces, scientists with their patience and skill have gradually built up a picture of the past.
scientists have divided the past into separate periods. Each period seems to have had its own special kinds of life. For instance, the Carboniferous period was the one in which the vertebrates, creatures with backbones, came out of the sea and conquered the land. Before then, the only living creatures on land were a few primitive insects. In the course of time, the trees and plants in the jungles and rainforests of the Carboniferous were pressed and squeezed by the weight of rocks on top and turned slowly into coal, the coal which today we dig out of the ground for heat and power. 80 million years went by and the Triassic period began. There were turtles then which looked much the same as they do now. But other Triassic animals have vanished. including the Cherotherium, which left its one footprint. Who can say how many other kinds of animal there were about which we know nothing at all? Once again, there were tremendous changes in the world, and the sea covered vast stretches of the land. The Jurassic period began. Forests of lush tropical plants and trees sprang up again, fed on by huge reptiles, the dinosaurs. The next period was the Cretaceous, and towards the end of it, these great reptiles suddenly and mysteriously vanished, never to come back. And the way the mammals grew and spread in the next tertiary period was just as strange. Several mammals grew to enormous sizes, the long-necked rhinoceros, for example. By now, the world of plants and animals was beginning to look more like it does today. And then, about a million years ago, came the Ice Age. The mammoth lived in a bitterly cold, merciless climate when animals needed thick fur to protect them. The glaciers pushed further and further south and drove the animals to seek shelter in holes and caves. On the walls of these caves, we have found traces left behind by early man. Bold, clear drawings of the animals familiar to him. Man was probably the first creature ever to look at the world around him with curiosity. Today, this inquisitiveness about the world has allowed scientists to look back into the past, to learn from the rocks the story of creatures that lived once long ago were buried by wind and sea, and then turned into stone. And this goes on happening all the time.